Welcome to the Alpha Girl Confidence Podcast, where we are empowering youth female athletes to play and live confidently. My name is Shay Hatto, and each week I will bring you new episodes to teach you the strategies and tools that you need in order to live a confident, empowered life both on and off the playing field. Hey, welcome back to the show. So on today's episode, I interviewed Jill Peterson, who is the co-founder of Girls Mentorship, whose mission is to coach girls on how to gain self-awareness, self-confidence, and self-worth. In this episode, we talk about body image and how it affects confidence as a whole, both on and off the field. We also dig into the role that parents and the media play and how we perceive our bodies as women. This is an awesome episode for not only players, but, but, but for parents who are looking to learn more about how they can help their daughters have better self-worth. So parents and players, get ready to dive into this awesome conversation. And because I know this episode can help so many girls, please share with a friend. All right, enjoy. What's up, Jill? Thanks so much for coming on the show today. I can't wait Hi, to have you. Yay! Yay! So I'm super excited to have you for a few reasons, which I'll get into. Number one, because your energy is like my favorite in the whole world. So I just can't wait to talk to you. And number two, because we're talking about body image today. And I feel like that's something that I've been wanting to talk about, but I don't know how. So I think that you're the perfect person for it. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. I I think it's a conversation that needs to constantly be talked about. Um, and I'm really honored that you are diving a little bit deeper into this topic for girls. Absolutely. So before we dive a little bit deeper, tell my listeners a little bit about you, your background and what you're up to right now. Oh, you're so sweet. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Jill Peterson. I live in sunny Scottsdale, Arizona, and I run my own business. So similar to what Shay does, um, I, I do similar work. Um, I'm a confidence coach for girls, and uh, my business partner, Mary, and I coach middle and high school girls on how to gain self-awareness, self-confidence, and self-worth. And um, I've been in this work uh, for the last two years. And prior to having my own coaching business, I worked at Lululemon for eight years. So my background is in leadership um, and corporate America. And really everything that I did there is um, I, I've transferred all of the skills and the experience that I've learned and I'm pouring into um, into the next generation of female leaders. And it's so cool. So that's a little bit about me. Um, some things you need to know. I do have a ton of energy. I feel <laughs> like that is one of my God-given gifts. And I, I'm like this all the time. A lot of people are like, is it just when you're in front of people? No, when no one's around, I have my own dance parties. Um, so I have a ton of energy and I also have two amazing boys. I'm a proud mom of two boys, which is pretty hilarious uh, that I coach <laughs> girls. Um, and I always get the question, are, are, are you gonna coach boys one day? Who knows? Um, and they're a handful. Oh my goodness, they're four and they're six. So what's cool about being in the work uh, coaching girls and working with parents is that I am one. Um, I was once a girl, I was once an athlete and, um, and now I'm a parent. So I feel like I, um, can really relate to everyone that I serve and I'm excited to be, uh, that voice and, um, a, someone, uh, a resource for you, Shay and your community as well. Love it. And love you. And thank you for being here again. Um, tell us a little bit more, because I actually don't know a lot about your like athletic background. I feel like we've never really had yeah. that discussion. So so tell everyone a little bit like your athletic background growing up and that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, so growing up, I had an older brother and he's three years older than me, two years in school. So um, we were, he was, uh, he was a I mean, his, his, his sport was basketball and I always wanted to be my brother's shadow. So I then got into basketball and I quickly learned, um, well, I quickly learned, but I think it was also from the advice of my dad that I was a ball hog and I, I wasn't a, I wasn't a good team player. I, I wanted to throw the ball into myself and then catch the ball, like give me a pass down the court and make a layup. 
my dad was like, there are other people in front of you that you can pass to. So um, as you can imagine, basketball did not end up being my sport. I'm also 5'3", so I'm a little peanut. Um, and I got into, I was always into dance and gymnastics. And honestly, gymnastics just became my fame. It was an individual sport. I was competing against myself and I loved it. So I was a competitive gymnast from the age of seven all the way to high school. And then, um, of course, I got the cheerleading bug uh, when I was in high school. So I also cheered from uh, high school or freshman year until I was um, a senior in, in high school. So that was it. And I, I, I hung up my cheer uh, skirt and megaphone, whatever. I really wanted to cheer in college, but I was like, I kind of want to have a college experience as well. So um, everyone asks me, I have these muscles i have this hey right wait, wait, wait. Hey. If, if you're um, only listening to this on itunes make sure you go to youtube because <laughs> she's just flash her I gun just flex i just had a flex off um but i still look like a gymnast so um i'm i'm grateful that i had uh this awesome upbringing of fitness and wellness from a very young age because it's definitely transferred into me being an adult. I'm still competitive. Um, I still like to pretend that I can do flips, but um, I also have to watch out for my hips and my knees, you know? <laughs> yeah, really. I, I, um, so you're the first like gymnast that's ever been on the show and I have so much respect for gymnasts. My sister was one I, my mom made me quit when I was young because I was absolutely horrible. It wasn't my sport. I was a team sport. Give me a ball and I'm good. If right. not, it, no, no, don't sign me up for it. Yeah, um, right. But I think gymnastics, number one, I think it's the most physically demanding sport there is. And I think it's the most mentally demanding as well. Yeah. Would you agree? hundred percent. And um, it's funny because I think the work that you and I are both in around mental fitness would have served me hugely when I was growing up, I, um, I, I didn't have the tools to overcome failure. I wanted to win always. And when I didn't win, I threw a fit. Um, and it took a lot of failure for me to realize that I can just you know, I, I can learn from this. It's not about judging myself. It's about learning from it and doing better the next time. But I threw a fit and it, it, and it took me down so many rabbit holes and um, self-doubt and constantly questioning myself where if um, I would have believed myself a little bit more than I didn't, I wonder how, how much further I could have gone right. because I was constantly sitting down on myself. Yeah. And I think that's, we, you and I both got into this for the same reasons and that we experienced a lot of the stuff we're teaching when we were growing up. Right. So I think that that's, you know, we've just been there and, and it's something that we're like, man, if we would have known this when we were, you know, in our sport, Ooh, game changer, right? Hey, we would have gone to the Olympic Shay. Oh yeah. We would have <laughs> both been Olympians. No doubt. <laughs> we could have been now been talking about a gold medal on this podcast. <laughs> oh, if only, if only, um, no. So kind of shifting into body image a little bit, is that something like, cause this is going to be, we're going to get as honest as we possibly can on this. Yeah. Is that something that you struggled with? And if so, like, when did it kind of start? You know, what's funny. I never struggled with body image. Uh, the only thing that I really struggled with because of my gymnast build was um, I think I started to really become aware of my body in seventh grade around middle school and I was flat chested. I had no boobs whatsoever, but I, I started to notice the girls around me and, you know, Hey, these girls are getting more attention because boys are talking about their bodies and why aren't, why aren't boys attracted to me? And is it because that I don't have what they have? So although it wasn't my actual build, I would definitely say that I was, I was, uh, in my head a lot about how I didn't feel feminine enough. Yeah. And I also went to the extreme of stuffing my bra. 
And I will never, <laughs> ever forget that I stuffed my bra to just see whose head I could turn. And I'm not kidding. One of my tissues was like <laughs> popping out of my bra and I got called out. And I was mortified. Oh I talk about the most embarrassing moment ever. And you're in middle school. And like that stays with you. And I'll never forget, like from that moment on, I was like, I'm never stepping my bra again. Like I can't be the per and I lied about it when I could have just been really truthful. So although it wasn't um, you know, it didn't take me down, but I still um, it, it stayed with me because as an adult, even growing up into being in college and going to parties and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I went to ASU and we were at, we were, you know, outside a lot and people were having us over to swim. And I'm like, what? I don't have anything compared to, I, I it was still, it still yeah. stuck with me. So, um, that what I would say that was the first time that I ever really went down, uh, and question um, how God made me um, and was and question if, if that was good enough because I wasn't getting the attention. I was seeking attention outwardly to validate what I didn't feel inside. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And we'll get into that too. And like, for me, um, I like the, the flat, flat chested example, like I wanted a flat chest and I have one. And so I was like, ah, I'm cool with that. It makes my life easier. Um, so side note there, but for <laughs> me, it was like, I would say probably middle school too. And, and when I first remember me, like, I don't think I really struggled with body image, but there was a few things. Like I remember in uh, PE, when we would have to like change out of our school clothes and change into our, into our PE clothes. And everyone was like, would just change. And they like, wouldn't really care what people saw. And I felt like I was the only girl that like went into the bathroom to change because I didn't want anyone to see me. Uh -huh. And for me, it was like, like, I've always been like pretty in shape. And so it's not like I was embarrassed or like ashamed of like, oh, I had like a little gut or whatever, but even in college, I was like that because I felt like all my teammates had six packs and I would just like, I'm like in better shape now than I was in college. Yeah. But I like, I feel like that's something I struggled with my whole life was like being like, I would purposely not go to like swim parties just because I didn't want to put a swimsuit on. Absolutely. Number, yeah. Number one. Cause like my stomach wasn't like a six pack. It wasn't ripped. And number two, I didn't like my legs. I've never liked my legs. And so I have never to this day worn anything other than like board shorts. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like still something that it really affected me when I was a teenager. Like it stopped me from doing a lot of stuff even like I would, I would be self-conscious when I was playing, if people would look at my legs weird or something. Mm -hmm. And so it really affected me then it doesn't now. Cause I don't really care, but I don't think I realized how much body image affected me until like really recently. Yeah. And even just talking about it now, I'm like, dang, it actually yeah. did play quite a big role in how I like tried to not be seen, I guess. hundred percent. And imagine what you and I would have felt like if social media mm -hmm. were in existence when we were in middle and high school. The girls now are experiencing what you and I felt, but it's at such an extreme because it's coming at them in so many messages yeah. through school and comparison. And then not only comparison in person with their peers, but they're looking at people that are unrealistic on, on the, the internet. And now they're on Snapchat and uh, Instagram. There's filters to make you feel more beautiful than than what you look like. It's, um, it's, it's a pandemic, honestly, it is, yeah. um, not a pandemic. It's an epidemic, whatever <laughs> um, I think. It, it's, it's starting to be a thing. And, um, I'm just really grateful for this space to have someone like you bring conversations like this up because girls are struggling. Um, they feel like they're alone. And they don't, I, I what I want to make, uh, I want to, I want to create a space to let them know that 
um, everyone at some point in their life has had these feelings or have had thoughts about their nose or their ears or their weight or what size bra they wear. You know, your butt, if it's flat as a pancake, it's so awesome. Let it be flat, girl. You know, we have this unrealistic expectation of what beauty is. And what I want to debunk is um, beauty looks beauty looks in all different shapes and sizes. It's not a one size fits all. It's, um, it, it's unique to everybody. And if we can really continue to, um, to spread that message, I wonder how different girls would really feel about themselves because when they're not feeling a hundred percent, when they feel in the mindset of comparison, they're not living into their potential. Yeah. We don't get to fully see their light. Um, they don't fully get to be themselves. And what a disservice to not only themselves, but the other people that they could influence in their lives. Right. And you you brought up a really good point that I actually didn't think about before this call as it relates to body image. And it's really social media. Like for me, it was just the people I would compare myself to in the locker room. Mm-hmm. Right. But now it's like, there's literally someone you can compare yourself to at all times. And like you said, a lot of it is not even real. Right. And so it's, I, it's obviously something that needs to be talked about, but in my opinion, I don't think it's talked about enough. Would you agree with that? hundred percent. And why do you, why do you think it's not talked about enough, especially for teenagers? I think. Yeah. Um, honestly, I, I, I think, um, well, my belief is parents are, are the mirror to our children. And if parents, um, aren't aware of what they're doing on their phones in front of their children, then that's where it starts. Parents need to almost have this awareness of how often they're on their phone, what comes out of their mouth when they are on their phone, whether it's an email or they're on social media, because that's where kids pick it up. So we need to create a conversation around um, what, what, what does it look like as a parent um, what are we, what are we addicted to? What are, what, what behaviors or habits do we have that we're actually passing on to our kids without consciously thinking about it? Because I know for me, I'm not trying to damage my kids by any means. However, when they see me doing a TikTok dance, they're going to want to probably do the same. Or if I'm talking about a family that I'm looking at on social media because they're so put together and this mom is so beautiful, my kids are hearing that. So my my first uh, inkling is that parents need to become aware of how they use social media because their daughters are listening. Their daughters want to be them. And if mom is talking about Karen and Sally in a negative light or talking about her um, or talking about those women um, of, of having all the things that she doesn't have, what is that saying to, to her daughter? That mom's not good enough? And I mean, mom is hero in a lot of girls' eyes. So um, I, I, I would first say that parents need to have the awareness of, of what they do on their phones and how it translates onto their kids. And then secondly, I would say that parents need to get in, get in with social media. I love it when parents are like, oh, you know, TikTok and Snapchat and I don't know what the heck that is. And it's like, well, you should. You need to know what your daughter is looking at because there are adorable girls on these platforms who are dressed inappropriately or they're starting the new trend or they're starting the new thing and and your daughter is spending hours trying to be someone that she's not but if you're not in it with her to have the right conversations then you know then that's that that's where we need to start and not making anyone wrong for it um, but I really feel like we need to we need to do better as parents to almost get in it with our kids so that we don't 
we don't have, um, it, it's not going to be as destructive mm -hmm. as what it could potentially turn out to be when they're older. Yeah. And I'm glad you're on because you're a parent. And so you, you can see these things that I, I don't always think about, which I think is important. And even the way like parents talk about themselves, right? If they're talking bad about their own bodies, it's like, what are you teaching your, your daughter, yeah. right? Or if you're talking bad about someone's hair on the news, like that, it's not 100%. perfect or, you know, whatever it is, it's like, yes. I, I, I've been listening and reading and consuming a lot of content lately. That's that talks about like our, our upper limits and our limiting beliefs and yeah. stuff like that. And I think a lot of it does stem from what we're what we consume as kids, you know what I mean? And I know that no parent, like you said, ever wants to do anything to hurt their kids or whatever it is. But you, I feel like you just have to be so aware of yeah. what you say and how you say it, because it really does leave like a long lasting impact on your kids' deep rooted beliefs. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, Oh my goodness. It's so impair. It, it's so imperative and important. And, um, as much as we, cause we are coaches for girls, we want to pour into these girls to really breathe belief in them. Parents need to do the work simultane simultaneously with them to, to, um, uncover some, some, behaviors or past experiences that have led them to believe something about themselves. So I'm a big fan of, of doing personal work um, with, with your daughter, with your son, as a family, do a challenge, like a 30 day challenge. Like we're only like positive affirmation, 30 day challenge, whatever it is um, to, to um, not always say like, oh, you need to be fixed or you need to talk a certain way. It's like, right. hey, how, how do we support one another and be better together? Um, because that also feels good as a girl. A girl doesn't want to feel like, oh, um, you know, mom's harping on my body um, because I like to eat. I like to intuitively eat. When my body says that I want to eat, I eat. But I, yeah, I might have an extra five pounds on me, but, but, it's like, Hey, let's do it together. Like, let's, let's go on a hike. Let's, as opposed to talking about the weight or how you look, um, if you want a result, like, why don't you get in action around what it is versus, you know, calling it out and making it wrong. Cause bodies are going to look different. Our bodies are all going to look different, but unfortunately society and um, the media has led us to believe that it it's one body type. And that's yeah. so far from the truth. Yeah. And like, it, for me, it's interesting because, um, growing up my, like my mom still has always been like, so incredibly ripped. Like she's had a six pack. She's, she's str probably stronger than me. She's way more ripped than I am. So like my whole life, she like growing up, she in the most subtle ways, I think made me feel like like my body wasn't quite good enough, but in the most subtle ways, like I know she didn't mean that, but it would be like, Hey sis, like that's a lot of food <laughs> or like, right. Hey, so if you're backhanded you're, comments where you're like, right. What like, does that mean? Right. Like, Oh, you're, you're eating again. Like we're, we're going to eat soon. Like you're hungry again. So like little tiny things like that. But I think that thinking back on it, like, even though in the moment, like I didn't really think anything of it, it may be set in my mind that like, if I want to look like my mom, I got to do this or do that or whatever. So I think it's like, like what I just kind of said earlier, like just being super aware of it. And like you said, is like, if you want to, cause that's what I was going to ask you is how can parents like, cause obviously you want, you want your kids to be healthy and you want them to, to do the right things, but how do you do it in a way where you aren't making them feel like they're not good enough. And I think you kind of answered it by just saying like, do it together. Like, is there anything else you kind of add to that? Yeah. And it, it's language. Like there is so much power behind your words and kid, it sticks to kids. It sticks like glue and who knows like how long that, that those words will last with them. It could last or it can stay with them their whole life. Mm -hmm. So it's being really mindful it's being mindful of how we communicate. Um, 
and and again it's not about like what what's the goal what's the goal of um your daughter um is is the goal for her to lose weight and and how how do you do it in a way that isn't um, making her feel like she has to be on a diet, but how do you do it together? Um, because again, it's like she wants support. She is going to feel isolated if it's only going to be about her. Mm -hmm. But if you just say, "Hey, the whole family for the whole month is going to wipe out one um, one food that we all love," maybe it's dessert, as opposed to us having dessert every night after dinner for thirty days we're going to not have it. Let's do it together and see how it makes us feel afterwards. Because what, what we, we often forget is that, um, say the girl needs to lose five pounds. Is that going to make her feel happy when she loses the weight? Mm. I don't know. Um, or when, even as an adult, when we often look at ourselves and poke and prod and oh my gosh, I look so gross. And I'm going to, on Bye. Monday, I'm going to start. And we say like, okay, I'm going to literally starve myself and work out excessively. When I lose that five pounds, I'll be happy. But then when you lose it, you're still not happy. Yeah. So how do we appreciate where we're at? And it's through gratitude. So I always like to share uh, the concept of, you know, you have this body that other people would probably die to have. You mm -hmm. have four able limbs, like you have two arms, you have two legs, you have this beautiful butt that you get to sit down on. How comfortable, you know, it's <laughs> like, oh, you have two functioning eyes. Like think about, think yeah. about in contrast that some people don't have that. So not, not falling in, not falling trap to, um, what we don't have, but appreciating what we do have. So gratitude is a really big thing in, um, in, in the journey of loving yourself and being okay, that your kid is going to look different than the other kid. And that's okay. That's okay. We were all meant to look and sound and be different, but for some reason it's not good enough. Mm. And it's through those small interactions, it's through the small conversations that you start to then pick apart yourself and then you're left feeling empty because you're not pouring into yourself. People aren't pouring into you. That's why positive self-talk is so important. Mm -hmm. Affirmations is so important. Moving your body to uh, release endorphins is so important. It's pouring back into you. So you don't feel like you have to look outwards. Like I said, yeah, right. You know that the love, no matter what stems from the inside. Mm, I love that. I think what you just said that about how you really have to pour into yourself and then you're not going to seek this external validation. I want everyone to rewind that part because that really is kind of like the answer there is to express gratitude. Number one, like I think gratitude helps with a lot of the, the negative stuff that goes through our head. But number two is like what Jill just said is really pouring into yourself, doing the things that you need to do to feel good about yourself internally. Because if you don't feel good about yourself internally, nothing on the outside is ever going to make you feel like you're good enough. And listen, I'm not going to sit here and say that all moms and dads or caretakers are their kids' biggest cheerleaders. Yeah. So you're going to have some parents that are going to poke and ask questions and like kind of have you like, whoa, did you just say that to me? But guess what? This is where community comes in. And, and if you are a soccer player, you have a team of girls who are your cheerleaders, your ride or die. That's why mentorship, what Shay does, what I do is so important because you come to us, honey, when you are having a bad day about your hair or your body or your butt, you call us up or you go to your best friend and you're like, I'm just having a day. I feel so ugly. And guess what? The right people will yep. always breathe belief in what you're not feeling. And you can borrow it for that day. Mm -hmm. I love when people borrow my beliefs about them. 
when you're having a bad day, you call me up and I will breathe the belief that you're not seeing right now, but you take it for a moment so that it doesn't take you down a rabbit hole because that rabbit hole will make you perform less when you play soccer. It'll make you perform less when you're at school. So it's all tied together. Body image is massive. Your community is massive. The way you speak to yourself is so important. But if you can blend all of those things together, when one isn't working and you have other people to lean on, I promise you it's going to make you feel better than feeling alone, than feeling isolated. Like you just holding on to those feelings yourself, leaning to the people who can breathe that belief in you and go and borrow it when you're not feeling great. I love that. And that was kind of bringing me to my next point of like, on a, on a big scale, like how much does body image really affect someone's confidence? And let's just, let's talk athletics here for a minute, right? Solely when it comes to athletics, how much do you think it affects confidence, you know, as an athlete? Oh, I, 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 I don't even know. I would, I would say it's a staggering high percentage. I really do. Um, And I I don't know, I don't know if there's a stat out there. I'm sure there is, but I would say it's above 50%. I would even say it's closer to 60, who knows? But girls are funny. No matter (laughs) if they are the, the most talented athlete and they're skilled at what they do, they are still looking for that external validation. Yeah. No matter what it is. And that's where this type of mental fitness, the conversation about confidence building and doing the steps to have you feel confident is so important because the only person that you need to compete against is yourself. Yep. But girls and women, I mean, adults, that's what we do. We look externally to like validate ourselves. Yep. I think everybody does it whether they know it or not, but oh my gosh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and listen, big butts, little butts, big <laughs> boobs, no boobs. It is. I mean, you are beautiful. You are beautiful. And you're probably going to listen to this and be like, oh, yeah, right. I don't feel that. I don't feel that right now, but listen, you have ha- you've you've spent 15 years say you're a 15 year old girl and for 15 years you haven't told yourself that so one day of telling yourself is not enough you got to do it every single day right if you're a great soccer player you didn't just wake up and be a great soccer player you practiced every single day you showed up and that's exactly what you have to do if you're struggling with your body you have to show up every day for your body. You have to be in gratitude. You have to say your, your positive affirmations about what you love. What are the five things that you love about yourself? Mm. And what are the five things that you don't love about yourself, but you can still be grateful for those things? Yeah. I like that. Cause like, I'm super, like, I like to give like, Hey, this is what you can do, like, this is what you have control over that you can do to feel better about your body. And I just took away two from that, which is like affirmations, which this is something I teach and preach all the time too. And it just like you said, it's not like all of a sudden, if you say one affirmation, I am beautiful, that you're going to feel beautiful, right? It takes a lot of practice and not just practice, but you have to be consistent about it. And the first time you say it, you're not going to believe it. The yeah. second time you say it, you're probably not going to believe it. But if you could keep saying it, it's going to like start to build that belief to where you actually think that thing, yeah. right? But it takes a lot of work. It's never going to happen overnight. And then the second was gratitude, right? So we just talked about that already, but just being grateful for what you do have, right? Like if I would have been grateful for my legs at the time, I think I wouldn't have struggled so much with, with how much I hated them, right? And so would, would you add anything else to... Like, what can a player do if, if she's struggling with body image? Like, what else can she do to kind of start feeling better and more confident about her body? About her body. I mean, I would first ask the question, like, I would have her ask herself the question of why. Like, why? Yeah. 
why aren't you feeling confident about your body? Like, what is it about your body that you don't love? And then from there, it's doing the things that you just said and practicing that. Um, I like to, I like to give the analogy of a 300 pound man and a 300 pound man is wanting to lose weight and he only goes to the gym one hour a week. That's what he commits to, but he wants to lose a hundred pounds. And do you think that one hour a week is going to get him to his goal in a month? Absolutely not. No, you, he needs to get into the gym every single day to move his body. He needs to make sure that his diet um, and, the, and he's blessing his body with the right foods. Um, and, and that's how it is with, with confidence for girls. It's, it's not a quick fix. It's, it's practice. So what, what about your body don't you appreciate? And then how do we say over time, how do we get you to learn to love it? Mm -hmm. You don't, maybe not love it, but like it, you know? <laughs> there are things on my body that I like, and there are things on my body that I love, <laughs> you know? Um, right. And that's okay. So get curious around what it is and why, why? Yeah. Is it because your body doesn't look like the Kardashians? <laughs> if you think your body is going to look like Kylie Jenner, do you think you're going to have a career in having your own makeup line? Like girlfriend, you have your own dreams, your own goals, your own aspirations. There is one Kylie Jenner in this world and that's enough. And now it's <laughs> on you to figure out what your goals and dreams are. And it can be equally as awesome. But the more that we harp on ourselves, we operate at a low frequency. So I also like to say this, um, you have a choice every single moment of your day to choose who you get to be. So you can operate at a high frequency, possibility, optimism, openness, right? Like you, you can be here or when you're in comparison or you're feeling frustrated or you're feeling like you're not enough, that's operating at a low frequency. And then what happens is that you are wearing those, those colored lenses and that's how life shows up for you. So if you're comparing yourself, of course you're gonna go to Circle K and you're gonna see some hot girl in some cute little tube top and sweatpants and you're like, look at her getting that polar pop. She's so cute. And I feel like crap, she can drink that, but I'm gonna go inside and get a kombucha. Like what the heck, right? It's validating how you're viewing life. Yeah. So how do you choose and be conscious? And that's where that awareness comes in is how do you choose consciously how you wanna show up for your life? Because then, right, you're gonna be, you're gonna look at the world differently and that's gonna validate how you feel about yourself. Right. Yeah. Can you appreciate that girl at Circle K and be like, dang, I'm going to go tell her how beautiful she is because I'm operating from a place of loving myself versus feeling bad about myself. And that's also where, I mean, we can go, we can do a whole nother podcast about friend, like girl friendships, right? The cattiness, the, the, the clicks, the whatever, but it all stems from that high frequency. And, and you guys, I, I'm a firm believer in like weird things. I have crystals. I, I do all the weird, you know, full moon stuff. But here's, here's the truth. When you operate at a high frequency, possibility falls in your lap. Blessings will come to you because you're, you're ready to receive it but not if you're closed off, not if you hate yourself, not if you're picking apart your body. And then, and then when you're like, why do bad things always happen to me? Well, shift your mindset, girl. Right. Yeah. And it's it, easier said than done, but it's practice. Right. Just and like you said, we, the things we tell ourselves, we are trying to prove ourselves right constantly. Yes. Right. So if you're telling yourself you're ugly, you're always going to try to find proof to validate that feeling. Yes. yes. It works that way with anything. You tell yourself 
you're awesome, whatever, like you're going to find proof in the world that validates that you're awesome. Yeah. So like Jill said, it really does start with your mindset and really like the perception you have, like what goggles are you wearing today or glasses, whatever. Yeah. Are you wearing your like, your like abundance goggles? Or are you wearing like, I'm a victim, like it's an abundance mindset or the victim mindset, yeah. which one are you going to be today? And it's yeah. and really up to you. You get to choose. Yep. You every day get to choose. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I kind of want to leave it on that note, but I do have one more kind of question that I thought of when we were talking and that is like going back a little bit to the media thing and just your opinion, just for my own selfish reasons, I'm curious to see what your opinion is, is do you think with the media, so I'm talking like big companies, Lululemon, Nike, uh, Adidas, do you think that they're getting better and shifting how they represent women in their advertising and their marketing? If you would have asked me this a year ago, two years ago, I'd say no. Um, but coming from the world of Lululemon, um, I know the, I know the conversation behind what, what the public sees. Yeah. And I know that they're working diligently to make that to have girls or women uh, walk into their stores and they see themselves in the people that are working there, but also yeah. uh, the, the mannequins because everybody's different um, and everybody is beautiful. So Nike has done a, a phenomenal job. Yeah. Um, Lululemon, but those are big box name brands. Do I think there's an opportunity for more brands to be diverse and inclusive, a hundred percent. Um, and, and I know that, you know, hopefully, uh, with more conversations like that, this, it sparks companies to be like, dang, you know, are people, um, are the people that I'm hiring look like me? Because when I worked at Lululemon, I, I, I wasn't trained on diversity and inclusion. Did that stop right. me from hiring people who were different backgrounds and cultures to work for me? Absolutely. But the more that, right, it was my perception. Yeah. When I got exposed to this whole new world, I was like, oh my gosh, look at all the people who look like me. I hire everyone who looks like me. <laughs> Yeah. And it wasn't intentional. Right. It was just because I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that more brands are going to diversify their bodies yeah. because um, girls, like that's what girls look to. And they will continue to look um, at cool mm -hmm. brands, at uh, cool marketing campaigns, you name it. Um, and I, I, And I hope my hope is um, that that stick figure girl who's a size double zero with D size boobs isn't the norm anymore. That's my hope. And that there are other bodies and body types that can become the norm. So girls will stop um, berating themselves. Mm -hmm. Yep. I agree. I think there definitely is progress that, that you can see in, in their advertising and, and stuff like that. But obviously it's, it's still a work in progress, just like, you know, women's equality and all of that. Like, yes, yeah. it's getting better, but is it where it needs to be? Absolutely not. So just yeah. wanted to kind of um, touch on that and get yeah. your opinion on well, that. Well, and I, I think the, like, it starts with the women on the ground. Yeah. So if there's anything that I can leave your listeners with, it's, yeah. knowing their influence, like even if they're not a CEO of a company, they're a CEO of a family or mm -hmm. they're a CEO of a friend group or um, of an organization or of a school, like your girls have so much influence and, um, mm -hmm. and, and I want more people on the ground, girls, women to realize that um, they're like how they show up in the world matters and yeah. don't you want to show up in a way that you love yourself and that you you include other women who are different and look different um and it starts with us yep I love that it's like you don't have to be an influencer you don't have to 
to have a big following, whatever, it right. can just be your people. Like it doesn't matter who you are. You have an influence over the people around you. Yeah. So like you said, like start with yourself and then like move that energy to the people that are around you. So I love that. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. leaving that with us. That's yeah. beautiful. Got it. Um, so as we bring this podcast to a close, where can people find you and follow you and soak up all your goodness? Find me on social media. Okay. So, um, you can find me at girls mentorship and it's spelled exactly how you spell it. G I R L S M E N T O R S H I P. So that's on Instagram. And then we're building out our Facebook group as well. So just find us same on Facebook at girls mentorship. Um, and you guys, I'm always available slide into my DMS. If you have questions, reach out if you just want to chat. My community is, um, I, we're growing it and I want Shay's community to be a part of my community and, um, I'm here for it all. So thank you Shay for having me. Yes. And well. for all of you bad chicas, mamas, parents, whoever's listening, you guys are awesome. Yes. And especially if you're a, a mom, like Jill is your girl, like she is, just, I mean, for everybody really like, oh, and Jill, do you, you have TikTok now, don't you? I do. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want to share? Have, your TikTok? I have a, oh yeah. And I wish I had like a, I think it's just my name, Jill Peterson. I'm not sure. Um, but <laughs> okay. follow me on TikTok. I'm here for it, honey. I am going to, so when parents are like, I don't know how to do that, whatever social media come to me. I'm going to get so into all of these apps that girls can't hide from us. So uh, follow me on TikTok. Um, follow me on Snapchat, all the places. And it's Peterson with an E, right? With an E, e yeah. S-E-N. Okay. Yeah. Just want, I'll, I'll make sure I get it right. And then if you're listening and you want to go, I don't have a TikTok, so don't try to find me. Go find Jill. I, I don't think I ever will. So thank you for doing it for the book. I got it. I got you, girl. <laughs> All right, Jill. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I'm sure the audience is going to absolutely love this episode. I'm sure they loved it. Um, so I appreciate you coming on. Thank you.